Uh, good morning, distinguished guests and friends. Um, first of all, congratulations to all of you for getting up so early. Um, last year it was 8.30, the year before it was 9. It's hopefully not going to be 7.30 the following year, but it's because we have a very packed schedule today. And for those of you who would otherwise have gotten up early to play golf, it's actually much healthier for you to be indoors today given the current haze that we have. Um, last night, our Deputy Prime Minister spoke about the bright economic prospects for Asia as a whole, and about the challenges facing the region and Singapore's proactive response to these challenges. This morning, with a much wider scope for discussions, my task is to set the context for a broader geopolitical discussion. And unfortunately, I think the mood is somewhat more sober than for that that we faced yesterday regarding Singapore. Last year, I spoke about the gathering storm clouds of a possible civilizational conflict between an aging Pax Americana and a rising Pax Seneca. Today, I think we can be quite relieved that the proverbial thunderstorm has not yet burst forth. However, the prospect that we do face instead is the gray, chilling, and unceasing drizzle of a protracted Cold War. And this second Cold War, if it does happen, may well persist into the next decade, even after today's human protagonists have departed the scene. Fundamental civilizational tensions may go deeper than whoever is currently or will be the occupant of the White House or Zonanhai. And there is no playbook for managing this conflict should it worsen. The last Cold War was largely a security issue, and other historical parallels going further back into the two world wars have not ended well for all sides. If anything, the recent resurgence of ultra-nationalist right-wing politics in virtually all the major nations of the last world war signals only greater frictions ahead. Deglobalization, particularly in the diminishment of international trade, investment, cross-border people movements, and the role of multilateral institutions and agreements will only fuel this dangerous trend further. As most of us know, business confidence is fading fast, even as global manu manufacturing has contracted and the services sector is expected to follow suit. Interest rates have little room to for further cuts, and the infamous bond yield curve has turned negative, which, as all our bankers know here, is historically a precursor of recession. The erosion of economic sentiment globally since we last met a year ago has been quite dramatic, and no one can possibly forecast today where we will be at the same time next year when we convene here. Four broad trends can perhaps be apparent in the future months ahead. First, as I touched on earlier, we may face a protracted, multi-dimensional Cold War, not just a trade or even an economic conflict. Across the board containment of China in every facet of human or societal behavior has become the organizing principle for the US with increasing weaponization of all instruments available in its economic, security, technological, and foreign policy arsenal. Previous advocates of the so-called Washington Consensus on convergence, that as China gets richer and more powerful, it will become more, quote unquote, like us, are busily repudiating their past positions. Anti-China is not the not only the single issue where Democrats and Republicans agree, it's also the only issue where they're outcompeting each other to be the bigger and badder China basher. When a senior American foreign policy planner recently proclaimed that the US was facing an unprecedented challenge because the potential conflict involved, quote unquote, a non-Caucasian civilization, no one even raised an eyebrow. I think it's a clear signal that the yellow peril has returned to Washington. And this has not gone unnoticed in Beijing by the proponents of a make China great again ideology, which proclaimed that China's 100 years of humiliation should end now. 
Whether the issue is Huawei or Hong Kong, Chinese leaders can afford to and will play the long game. China's ascension can be delayed, but impossible to prevent. And China is certainly not a pre-collapse Soviet Union playing a few desperate last cards, and it would be a dangerous mistake to equate today's China and yesterday's Soviet Union. Secondly, as America's influence in Asia continues to wane, Asian nations urgently need to find agreement on their highly emotive, divisive, and deep-rooted conflicts going back decades, and which up to now remains unresolved. These issues going back from World War II and even further before continue to overshadow and endanger relations between Japan and Korea, Japan and China, China and Taiwan, and between the two Koreas. When the US nuclear umbrella protected Japan from rearming and Captain America forcefully mediated between Japan and Korea or Japan and China, simmering issues could be papered over. In the dangerous void left by a gradually withdrawing America, these tensions can only rapidly escalate and be become dangerously dangerous conflicts potentially. The depth of bitterness and the speed of escalation in Japan-Korea tensions in recent months is a case in point. Northeast Asia, therefore, needs to create a new framework for cooperation as American hegemony over the area gradually diminishes. And this will be one of our topics today. Thirdly, nations are increasingly pressurized to take sides as a US-China Cold War polarizes issues. Hopefully, this will stiffen rather than undermine the resolve of ASEAN to remain proactively neutral and to speak truth to power, rather than succumb to a divide and rule strategy by either the United States or China. And the South China Sea is a good example. China has consistently objected to America's de facto role as judge, jury, and executor of the so-called rules-based international system after World War II. And most grating to the Chinese view, is the fact that the US effectively governs the rules of engagement in what China considers its own backyard. The unequal parallel being that the US considers the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean Sea to be off limits to any other superpower, and this is accepted by everyone. And the Chinese, to demonstrate that the South Chinese Sea is indeed its backyard, which is essentially an euphemism for sphere of influence, China has, as we know, proposed a code of conduct for regional states to agree and to adhere to. This agreement is being finalized and hopefully should reduce tensions between the China and the claimant nations of Southeast Asia. But extremely glaring is the intentional exclusion of the US from these negotiations. And that should the US consequently reject this code of conduct in actions, if not only in words, and aggressively challenge Chinese dominance over these waters, an eventual skirmish is not at all impossible. ASEAN nations will then find it very difficult to remain neutral against conflicting Chinese and US pressures. And this is when ASEAN solidarity and neutrality will truly be put to the test. Fourth and finally, what previous cold, or for, for that matter, hot wars have seen is a bifurcation of the physical world into geographic blocks. But the new Cold War may see a bifurcation of the digital or virtual world and that will have enormous ramifications. The ideal digital world consists of a seamlessly connected global platform with universally accepted operating systems, shared hardware and software standards, and interconnected regulatory protocols. This has been good for business, and it's been economically efficient for global connectivity. It was also the norm until the American ban on Huawei came along. China saw this as an unprecedented, concerted attack on Huawei as the first step of an aggressive blockade of Chinese firms from Western leading edge technologies such as next generation internet systems, robotics, and artificial intelligence. And this could lead to a broader strategic decoupling between China and the US. Indeed, this seems to be the new Washington consensus. Should this happen, China may not be unduly panicked, after all, China has already intentionally decoupled much of its digital universe with, for example, WeChat and Weibo, completely replacing, say, WhatsApp and Facebook. Whilst a more 
extensive digital decoupling may delay China's advance into the rest of the global market, it is probably the only country with both the market size and indigenous technologies to create its own ring-fenced digital world of operating standards, systems, and platforms, and from there to overseas neutral marketplaces. For the rest of the world, however, the economic and technological inefficiency of bifurcated digital platforms will not only be extremely costly, but also represent a severe setback to globalization. However, in a bifurcated world, whether geographic or digital, there will always be an important role for the proactively neutral and yet fervently sovereign countries, such as Singapore, to play a vital bridging role, much as uh, Switzerland did uh, during the last century between two hot wars and even one cold war. Now, for this, for this year's sessions, we've introduced a the theme of Asia 2030 for the Singapore Summit. Indeed, it is the aspiration of the Singapore Summit to be the platform of choice for updates and discussion on trends, both positive and negative, in Asia and between Asia and the world. After the broad sweep discussion in our first general discussion, we will have two geographically themed general discussions on Northeast and Southeast Asia, followed by some shorter, higher focus sharing sessions that will delve into corporate best practices to tackle pressing issues of the future. In curating the content for this year's conference, we have for the first time included various think tanks in Singapore, and I thank them for their contributions, and also to the Women's Forum for curating the session on women and management. We're also pleased to include young societal leaders from the region who are passionate about a variety of social causes. Intergenerational dialogue continues to be a very important priority at the summit, and we look forward to hearing the perspectives of two young societal leaders. This year, we have the special privilege of having exceptional speakers representing views from different parts of the world, and they include Mr. Mr. Fumio Kishida, Chairman of the Policy Research Council of the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan and its longest serving Foreign Minister. His Excellency Wu Tong Tun, Union Minister for the Ministry of Investment and Foreign Relations of Myanmar. Dr. Zhou Xiaochuan, President of the China Society for Finance and Banking and former Governor of People's Bank and the Chairman of the Monetary Policy Committee of the People's Bank of China. Now, even as Asia continues to prosper and looks beyond its traditional markets of the US and Europe, it is timely to consider a continent whose time has also truly come. The Asia-Africa relationship remains relatively undeveloped and therefore offers much potential. It is therefore very timely that His Excellency President Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta will start this conference by sharing his thoughts on areas for potential partnerships. President Kenyatta is the fourth and current president of Kenya. He's a well-regarded African leader and a friend of Singapore. May I ask you to join me in welcoming His Excellency President Kenyatta to deliver his remarks, after which we will have a short Q&A session. Thank you very much.